welcome everybody to Pink Wink 2021. I'm Dr. Melissa Drake here to talk about women's rights in medicine. Which rights are we talking about today? We could certainly spend many, many hours talking about uh, different kinds of women's rights in healthcare. But what I'd like to talk about today is just three aspects in particular that I think are pretty pertinent to Pink Week 2021. First of all, uh, the World Health Organization's statement on healthcare as a human right and health as a human right. Additionally, models of care delivery. And then finally, I'd like to focus on some legal aspects and insurance coverage aspects of uh, women's rights in medicine. The World Health Organization describes the right to health. The World Health Organization Constitution in 1946 described the highest attainable standard of health as a fundamental right of every human being. And states or nations are obliged to support this right to health via, quote, a progressive allocation of maximum available resources. And I think there's significant room for debate about whether or not we're using the maximum available resources here in the United States, or whether there's a failure of guts or imagination to produce action to get access to healthcare guaranteed for every American woman. Uh, but that is what the World Health Organization describes as, quote, the right to health. Integral to the right to health is how medical care is delivered in uh, particular, which model of care is being used to deliver healthcare and medical care. And there are three primary models that everyone is probably fairly familiar with. The paternalistic approach, the patient-centered approach, and uh, the patient as partner approach. And everyone probably is familiar with what we call the paternalistic approach. This is the classic model of healthcare where the doctors and other healthcare professionals are the ones who are at the center of the intervention plan and patients take little part in uh, their own care decisions. There is a difference between the patient-centered approach and the patient-as-partner approach. And so what is that difference? Patient-centered care puts patients at the center of the work and concerns of the healthcare professionals, whereas the patient-as-partner is actually quite different. Patient as partner means patients are integral members of the healthcare team. They have unique expertise, uh, unique responsibility, and unique contributions to the healthcare team. Essentially, the patient becomes a caregiver of herself and takes on the role of self-healer. This does not necessarily mean that the patient needs to be uh, involved in every interdisciplinary meeting or weigh in on every single decision. We don't ask that of any team member in healthcare. Uh, but it does mean uh, that the expertise that the patient brings, that lived experience, the ways of knowing that each patient has, is an important and, and integral part of the healthcare model. And so there's a quote that I've got from my, uh, from my medical school curriculum, which starts and shocks people. The patient is not a part of the healthcare team. The patient is the head of the healthcare team. And so if you start with just the patient's not a part of the healthcare team, that can shock uh, most modern clinicians. But uh, bringing it home, the patient really is the head of the healthcare team, the most important part. And so what happens when women are empowered to take control of their care? You have two really important primary situations here. Outcomes improve. Compliance is improved in terms of you know, medication management and clinical pathway management. And additionally, patient satisfaction really skyrockets. So one example of this, uh, I'd like to move here into some particular examples of how the patient as partner approach and patient-centered care both are being encouraged with uh, legal acts as well as um, some interesting new models of care at various places. The first thing that's fairly new as of this year, but that's been developed and promoted by Harvard Medical School and Beth Israel Deaconess for a while now, is the Open Notes Project, and they're at opennotes.org. And this was a bit of a game changer in the medical community. The idea of Open Notes is that you have the right as a patient to read the notes your care provider is making. And because of this, information really is power. It's a very empowering thing to know as a patient what's being written down about you. It helps really improve absorption and comprehension of the care plan. And additionally, it allows the patient, the patient as partner, to make corrections in the medical record to ensure that everything in there is accurate. As a clinician, it, as I said, 
was a bit of a, uh, as I said, a bit of a game changer. And um, I think some uh, uh, places have been a little resistant to it, but it's really at the heart of the patient as partner approach to start this open notes project. Even more so, at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Research Institute, there is what they are describing as the zone of openness. And it's not a physical place, but it's a uh, metaphorical place that they've attempted to open in the medical care model. And what it involves is four key components. First of all, an orientation video for patients. It's an animated video that describes uh, the importance of asking questions, of asking about alternatives, et cetera, as well as a four-page booklet that patients are encouraged to use to prepare and take notes prior to their visit. And then from the, on the flip side, there's additionally an orientation video for doctors to uh, prepare them for patients who may be asking more questions or different kinds of questions than they may have been used to in the past, as well as a standardized patient encounter with actors as a training for doctors so that they can also work through their responses to new questions that they may be receiving about care alternatives, care plan uh, issues and situations that may arise because of this zone of openness. And it was shown um, in several studies to really improve both patient satisfaction as well as other outcomes in medical care. Another uh, very important and pertinent thing for uh, the Breast Cancer Resource Center and women in general was the Women's Health and Cancer Rights Act. Uh, in 1998, and this was uh, really groundbreaking. This was really the first time that uh, Congress said uh, specifically what health care plans have to cover. This was the first time that they said, if you do this, you must do that. And what the Women's uh, Health and Cancer Rights Act says was that plans that cover mastectomy must cover reconstruction, as well as other things. Symmetry surgery, surgery on the other breasts to promote symmetry of the breasts, nipple and areola reconstruction and tattooing, flap reconstruction, as well as any prostheses that may be necessary before or during reconstruction, and that does include breast implants, as well as the physical complications of mastectomy and other surgeries, including lymphedema. So that also means support garments for people who have lymphedema. Now, as with all acts of Congress, this does not necessarily apply to state and local government run plans. So it doesn't apply to Medicare, it does not apply to Medicaid. Medicaid pays for mastectomy plus reconstruction on a state-by-state -state basis. California is very lucky that uh, they have brought themselves in line with the WHCRA. The Affordable Care Act was also a big game changer in women's health care rights. Um, in 2014, one of the biggest things that affected women in general was the, um, the pre-existing conditions caveat, saying that group health care plans cannot limit or deny benefits related to a pre-existing condition. And women as a group before the Affordable Care Act were the ones who were most likely to have a pre-existing condition, something as simple as having a breast cancer diagnosis, having a C-section in the past. These were pre-existing conditions and pre-Affordable Care Act, pre-2014, there was no prohibition for health plans to deny coverage, deny benefits, or even remove people completely from plans. The other important part of the Affordable Care Act for women was the coverage of preventative care copay free. And this means uh, mammogram every two years for people over the age of 50, as well as mammogram yearly in selected high risk patients if a, if a doctor recommends it, and the 40 to 49 year age bracket. And again, how did the Affordable Care Act also affect things like genetic cancer testing? So the other really interesting thing is breast cancer genetic test counseling is covered by the ACA for women at higher risk. Now it's not, uh, there's definitely room to move on this. It currently only covers BRCA1 and 2. It does not cover other genes or multi-gene panels like things on Invitae or, um, or Progenity or those other panels. Um, but it does cover BRCA1 and 2. There's a really interesting group called FORCE, Facing Our Risk of Cancer Empowered. They have a wonderful, wonderful website with peer navigation where if you've gone through testing and you've gotten it paid for, they really encourage those folks to sign up for the peer navigation program so that they can be connected with other people who are looking into testing. And they've got a wonderful database of low-cost alternative testing options for people who uh, need breast cancer genetic testing. The other great thing about the ACA in terms of genetic cancer stuff was that breast cancer chemo prevention counseling for women at higher risk is also covered. 
Um, as before, Medicare and Medicaid are not required to abide by the same rules as the group plans. The ACA really actually affected the private insurers, but the Kaiser Family Foundation has a wonderful searchable database of Medicaid benefits. It's uh, very easy to navigate. It breaks it down state by state. You can search for the specific procedure or test that uh, you'd like to have performed and see if it's covered by Medicaid in that state. How did the Affordable Care Act affect research for women's health? So it created the, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, the PCORI. And this is a real powerhouse of patient-centered questions getting answered. Um, most research in the past has been funded by pharmaceutical companies. So they ask questions uh, like, does this drug shrink the tumor? But patients have different kinds of questions, like how often should I get a mammogram? If I have dense breasts, does this affect how often I should be screened? Should I use a risk-based screening schedule or an age-based screening schedule? Should I get radiation therapy for DCIS? What's the most effective way to manage my pain and nausea? These are really patient-centered research topics, and this is what the PCORI is focused on. Uh, it identifies patients and caregivers as the real primary stakeholders in research initiatives. And it's funded by the PCR Trust Fund, which gets funds from the Treasury Department, as well as a fee that's assessed to private plans. The other great thing about the PCRI is they, another focus that they've got is translating medical research into plain English. They're very focused on as soon as a study is completed and published, getting a plain English summary out so that patients can understand what was actually studied and what does it mean for each person. Looking towards the future, some active targets for advocacy include expanding access and coverage for more comprehensive cancer genetic testing. As I said before, the ACA uh, really for the first time expanded coverage for any cancer genetic testing, but as I said, it covers really only BRCA1 and 2, and there are a lot of other active gene targets that can be tested. And so testing for things like BARD and other targets would be a really wonderful um, advocacy target in the future. One of the more important active targets is developing clear, concise, and comprehensible summaries of research findings. There's been a trend in the United States for science reporters and the general media to seize upon sound bites and other um, aspects of a research study immediately upon publication, um, and in a way that doesn't assist the general public in interpreting the research and really allows a lot of room for conspiracy theories to develop and other sorts of things that may not have been intended by the research. And so developing those concise and comprehensible plain English summaries of research findings is a really important advocacy target for the future. Finally, a really big and uh, uh, somewhat daunting but important target is also expanding coverage and access to health insurance for all. So not everyone remains covered by health insurance in the United States. Uh, we've gone a long way towards expanding that access, but really uh, striving towards complete comprehensive coverage for all is an important and active advocacy target. And then finally, supporting local boots on the ground initiatives uh, that directly support patients such as the Breast Cancer Resource Center really is a rewarding and important advocacy target for the future. I want to thank everybody for listening today. I'm Dr. Melissa Drake. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this webinar on women's rights in healthcare. I hope you have a great Pink Week. I want to thank the Breast Cancer Resource Center for everything they're doing in Santa Barbara for Santa Barbara women on their journey. And thanks. Have a great Pink Week, everybody.